Yes! What is up, everyone? And because I've already talked about the Euros, which is one of the two big international tournaments coming up this summer, and not the other one, the Copa America, I said to myself, fuck it. Let's do another preview. So let's talk about the longest running continental competition in the world and the biggest in South America by telling you that first, it's actually not gonna be in South America this time around. It's gonna be held in the United States. And do you wanna know why? Money, 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 money. So now that we understand the real motivation behind this competition, which whatever, I'm fine with it, make your money. I'm just glad the US can get some meaningful games in before the 2026 World Cup since we really won't otherwise due to us automatically qualifying as the host. But we can talk about that massive event once it gets closer. Right now, let's Let's dig into the details of Copa America. This tournament, which is now 108 years old, will have 16 teams, 10 from each of the South American nations, and six from North America, who all had to qualify through the 2023-24 CONCACAF Nations League. Of this group from CONCACAF, all four semifinalists of the most recent Nations League were invited, which included the US, Mexico, Panama, and Jamaica, while Canada and Costa Rica earned their spot through play-in matches. With these 16 teams locked in, they will be broken up into four groups of four with the top two from each group qualifying for the quarterfinals, and then it will be single elimination until we get to the final itself. The whole thing kicks off on Thursday, June 20th, with reigning World Cup and Copa America champion Argentina taking on my pal Jesse Marsh and his new squad, Canada. And good luck with that, Jesse. That's not going to be easy. Also, just like the Euros, the final will be held on July 14th. So that's going to be a pretty fun day. But enough of the intimate details. Let's go alphabetically and dive into Group A, which includes tournament favorites Argentina, who I just mentioned, alongside Peru, Chi Chi Chi, Le Le Le, and O oh, Canada. And I'm just going to say it. If Argentina doesn't win this group, it must be because Lucas Paquita has money on it because I just don't see how it's possible otherwise. Not only are they running things internationally in their last two major competitions, Argentina have the GOATs on their team, the greatest of all time, Christian Romero. Ha ha ha. I'm talking about the GOAT and getting yellow cards. That guy rules. But speaking of the real GOAT, let's take a moment to discuss the great Leo Messi. And despite him being a little more injured than usual as he ages and navigates the high seas of MLS with Inter Miami, He's still easily the most important player on the team. And fun fact, whenever he plays his first game of this tournament, he'll break the record for most Copa America appearances of all time with 35. Also, fun fact times two, do you know who he played against in his first ever Copa America game who inspired him to go on and have a great career because of this epic tackle? Yes, this gringo right here. Roll the clip. <laughs> <laughs> that never gets old, and thankfully he didn't score in that game. But if he scores five goals throughout this tournament this time around, he'll have the most ever Copa America goals, which is a record that has stood since 1953. Also, another fun fact, because I'm full of fun facts today. Did you know that Pelé and Diego Maradona never won a Copa America? Yeah, that's true, and that blows my mind. And now let's talk about a team that beat Argentina in the Copa America final in back-to-back -back years, Chi Chi Chi. Lay, 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 because I was at both of those finals that they won. The first in Santiago in 2015, and the second in New York in 2016. So I consider myself a bit of a good luck charm for La Roja. However, I'm not sure even my mere presence, nor the hiring of one of the most experienced head coaches in South American football, Ricardo Gareca, who helped Peru do incredible things in this tournament by overachieving with a runner-up finish in 2019, third place in 2015, and fourth place in 2021, can help Chile work through the transition from their golden generation of Arturo Vidal, Alexis Sanchez, Claudio Bravo, and Gary Medell, who by the way, are all on this squad, and they're also all over the age of 35. What is this, TST? <laughs> Those guys should play in that tournament next year. So I don't know, this tournament might be too big of an ass for the Chileans, especially because they have struggled recently in World Cup qualifying, where they currently sit in eighth, only ahead of Bolivia and Peru. And speaking of Peru, they hired a 71-year-old back in December, Jorge Fossati, after getting off to a terrible start in World Cup qualifying, where they have scored just one goal in their six games. They have zero wins, and they sit at the very bottom of the table. And then you add in the fact that Fossati has had very little time with his new team ahead of this tournament. Peru's opening game against Chile in Arlington, Texas on June 21st will only be his fifth game in charge and I'm not too hopeful about their chances. Which leaves us with K. 
Canada, who are now led by my former Call It What You Want podcast host, Jesse Marsh, who's in his first coaching role since being sacked by Leeds. And it's a big one. Not only to continue to build on what Canada achieved in 2022 after qualifying for their first World Cup in 36 years, but also in making sure that they don't squander this golden generation that they find themselves in with Alfonso Davies, Jonathan David, and Tejon Buchanan in particular. Their first test under Jesse against the Netherlands in a recent friendly started off well. I thought they looked pretty good for about 35 minutes before they got outclassed at the end to lose 4-0. But in their next friendly against France a few days later, I was really impressed with their reaction to that loss and in how much more organized and determined they looked as they earned a well-fought 0-0 draw against one of the world's best teams. So, some questions. One, can they replicate that in their first game against Argentina, at least their performance against France? And can they take the initiative when they play someone more at their level or maybe even below their level like a Peru or Chile? I say, yes, 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 they can. A uh, duh. You like that? You like that? That's pretty good. So I have them finishing in second behind Argentina, which means they will have a date with the winners of Group B in the quarterfinals. The issue is, I don't know who that's going to be because in Group B, which features Mexico, Ecuador, Jamaica, and Venezuela, it really feels like the most wide open of the groups because I'm not sure which version of any of these teams is going to show up. All of them can be good in moments, and there's recent evidence that they can hold their own against the best of the best, but which one of them is going to be good consistently? That's the trick. Like, let's take Venezuela, who are the only team from South America to never qualify for a World Cup. But after a solid start to the 2026 World Cup qualifying campaign, including a first ever point away to Brazil and home victories over Paraguay 1-0 and Chichichi Lelele 3-0, they're currently in fourth on the table. So hopes are starting to rise about what they might be capable of. But like Canada, I have some questions. Can Venezuela take their second best defense in World Cup qualifying and make that translate in a tournament format in Copa America? Can the red hot Salomon Rondon, fresh off of scoring a brace in the final to help Pachuca win the CONCACAF Champions Cup, continue his good form? And I only ask these questions because their Argentine coach, Fernando Batista, is gonna need his players making plays consistently. A key word for me throughout this video and on both sides of the ball. They can't just do it on one side of the ball and they're gonna need it. And they're gonna have to replicate that over and over if they wanna match their semi-final run back in 2011, their best ever finish. Will they? Can they? Or will it be the reggae boys of Jamaica who, if you listen to the bookies, are the third least likely to win this tournament with huge, huge odds. In fact, if you bet $100 on Jamaica to capture this trophy, you would win 15 grand. But please consider this before you put any money on them. They've been in the Copa America twice before in 2015 as an invitee and in 2016, which like this Copa America was hosted in the US and had 16 teams in it for its 100th anniversary. And in those games, Jamaica lost all six. They scored zero and they gave up nine. And I think they're gonna improve upon those terrible stats, mainly by scoring a goal or two, but I don't think they have enough to push through into the knockout rounds. I'm sorry, Jamaica. You have the best kits, but I don't think that's gonna translate into success on the fields. So again, I don't see the reggae boys going through. Unlike Ecuador, who I like a lot. They have a young squad with an exciting core group of young stars who played at the 2022 World Cup, including defensive midfielder Moises Caicedo, who plays at Chelsea, defenders Piero Incapié, who plays for Bayer Leverkusen. They were obviously magnificent last season. And Purvis Estupinian, who plays at Brighton. Plus 23-year-old forward Gonzalo Plata, who has six goals and 37 caps. Now, obviously, qualifying for the 2026 World Cup is the main goal of their coach, Felix Sanchez, as Latri sit fifth out of the 10 teams after six games with three wins, two draws, and one loss. But here's a telling stat. Ecuador has posted shutouts in their last three World Cup qualifiers, which is a great sign of their organization as a group because being tough to break down is a hallmark of any good team. However, they've only scored five goals in these six games, which is the lowest of any team currently in one of the top six qualifying spots, which is not a great sign. So I have them getting out of this group because I think their talent is undeniable overall. But after that, it's so hard to say. Maybe. Maybe a favorable matchup in the quarterfinals puts them into a semifinal, which has only happened twice in their history, in 1959 and 1993. But I can't see them getting any farther than that. Kind of like the last team in this group, Mexico, who, and I don't think this is a hot take by any stretch of the imagination, are not the same Mexico as before. So my biggest question about this group is, who is their guy that they can lean on when things aren't going well? Or who is their guy that they can see step up and make a big play or score a big goal 
when the team needs it? Who's going to put the team on their back? Where's their current Cuauhtémoc Blanco or Hugo Sanchez or Rafa Marquez or Claudio Suarez, Andres Guardado, Jared Borghetti, Chicharito? Who are their leaders? In their most recent friendlies, they lost 4-0 to Uruguay and were down 2-0 to Brazil's B team before storming back to make it 2-2 to get everyone excited, only to then give up a goal in injury time to lose 3-2 and break everyone's hearts. Which again is a sign of a lack of leadership for me. The best teams know how to manage games. If you give up one goal, how do you not let that turn into two or three or four? If you come back from two goals down like they just did, how do you see the game out and get that to a 2-2 draw, you know? I think and I feel and I believe, si se puede, that Mexico will get out of the group alongside Ecuador. But after that, I'm not sure they have what it takes to do anything else but just to get out of the group. So now let's pivot to Group C, which includes my United States of America, and I pledge allegiance to the flag of Conradinho. Bolivia is also in this group, Panama too, and then last but not least, it's Uruguay. Love those guys. And listen, with all due respect to Bolivia, who have won two out of the last 12 games, one of which was against the mighty Andorra, who are ranked 164th in the world, and the other was at home in La Paz against a struggling Peru. They're not great. So I'm just gonna cut right to the chase. I expect them to get bottom. In third, this is where I have Panama penciled in, because on paper, this is where they should finish. They're not as talented as the US or Uruguay, but they're well coached, they're organized, and you can tell that they believe in and trust each other, which can go a long way. In fact, their manager, Thomas Christensen, recently said this, it's difficult because individually, we are not better than a lot of teams, but collectively, if each player understands their role and their importance and responsibilities to the team, we can compete. And I love this mentality. However, I was pretty disappointed by their performance in the Nations League semifinal where they lost 3-0 to Mexico and then followed that up with a 1-0 loss to Jamaica in the third place game. But overall, there is something about them and maybe it's their lack of fear that I admire in them the most, which I believe makes them very dangerous. But not as dangerous as Uruguay. Who under the careful guidance of Jedi Master Marcelo Bielsa are currently in second in South America in World Cup qualifying, having scored 13 goals in their six games. That's the most of any team down there. But listen to this run that they're on. It's pretty good. After losing to Ecuador away from home 2-1, and this was after they had the 1-0 lead, which obviously was very disappointing. They came back from a goal down twice to draw with Colombia away from home, then beat Brazil at home 2-0, then went into Argentina and won 2-0, which is the only loss that Messi and his friends have suffered since winning the World Cup. But all of that was at the end of 2023. In 2024, they lost to Ivory Coast 2-1 back in March. Then they drew with Costa Rica 0-0 last week before easily dispatching of Mexico 4-0. And honestly, when I watch them play, they do create a lot of chances. So it's most likely gonna come down to Darwin Nunez. He's very good at getting himself in good spots and them getting him the ball. The trick is, can he finish those chances? If he does, Uruguay can get to the final. If he can't, they won't. Simple as. As it stands right now though, I have them finishing on top of this group, which leaves USA, USA, USA. Finishing in second, which I felt like is where we were going to land before we lost to Colombia 5-1 to in a friendly a few days ago. Also, I am recording this video before our friendly against Brazil. So I can't factor that result into this breakdown, but I'm gonna safely assume that we're gonna have a good response after getting our asses handed to us by the Colombians, but I'm not sure that's going to turn into a win against an incredibly talented Brazilian team. Regardless of how that one plays out though, this tournament is hugely important because our players are going to lack for competitive games leading up to 2026, as I mentioned before. So we need to be put under as much pressure as possible to fine tune who we are and how we wanna play. Which leads me to the issue that I have in our coach, Greg Berhalter, because I don't think he's gonna be our coach in 2026. And as I've stated many, many, many times in the past, we should never have had him be coach for a second World Cup cycle anyway, because it was clear in Qatar, and it's even more clear now that we hit a ceiling with him in charge. So the players need to hear a new voice with new ideas to take that next step as a group. Who that next coach is and when that next coach will show up is hard to say. My guess, if I had to look into my crystal ball, which I don't have, and guess, is Jurgen Klopp in early 2025. So remember that you heard that here. 
in case that happens, because I like being right. But I say this because this tournament is being played in the U.S. against top opponents, just like it will be in the 2026 World Cup. So I think this is a missed opportunity for that new coach to take charge and implement their methods and tactics in a similar setup. Instead, we're going to get a lot more of the same. And a lot more of the same, though good enough to get through this group, doesn't feel like it has the potential to make a deep run, despite my hopes and dreams of at least getting to the semifinals. Anyway, let's finish it off with Group D, which includes Brazil, Colombia, Paraguay, and Costa Rica, which might be the most straightforward group in this tournament. Because one, it's Brazil, who despite lacking the star power of a Cafu, Roberto Carlos, Marcelo, and Danny Alves in the outside back positions, which I think is their weakest link as a team. They are absolutely stacked everywhere else with a good mix of olds. I'm thinking early 30s with Allison and Gold, Danilo and Marquinhos in the back line. And Young with Endrick, who is 17, 18, going to go to Real Madrid. And Savio, who's only 20. These guys are pretty good. And in fact, they're so stacked, they left Gabriel Jesus, Richarlson, and Casemiro at home and are also without Neymar and Ederson due to injury. And guess what? They are still one of the favorites to win this trophy for a 10th time. But I'm not sure they're going to win this group because Colombia is red hot. They're currently on a 22 game unbeaten streak, including beating Brazil at home and World Cup qualifying after being a goal down. They beat Spain 1-0 in a friendly in March. They beat a good Romania team in March as well, going up 3-0 before settling with a 3-2 win. And I really love their roster. Luis Diaz causing havoc up top. Hamas Rodriguez, who always plays well for his national team, pulling the strings in midfield. And Davidson Sanchez being a steady presence in the back, mixed in with a group of young, hungry players and a great coach and Nestor Lorenzo, who seems to be pushing all the right buttons and giving them a clear identity in how they want to play. It's just a, a recipe for short and long-term success. So not only do I think they can win the group, I also consider them a dark horse to win the whole tournament, something they've only done once back in 2001. But out of respect for the other two participants in this group, let's give a little shine to the Ticos of Costa Rica, who always have so much pride and passion and belief in who they are, that always gives them, at least in my humble perspective, a chance in every single game. A good example is the 2022 World Cup, when they were in the group of death, and they lost 7-0 to Spain to start the tournament. Everybody thought they were gonna get walked over the rest of the way, and they beat Japan in game two, 1-0, and they were up on Germany, two to one, with 15 minutes left to go, before eventually losing 4-2 to two and not advancing. So I wouldn't be surprised to see them give Brazil and Colombia a run for their money. And the same with Paraguay. I think they're gonna give these teams a run for their money as well, but it's gonna be less run and gun like the Ticos and more 0-0-esque. I think that's more in the Wyo style. And I say this because in their six World Cup qualifying games so far, they've scored one which is Mierda, they know that. But they've only given up three, so they clearly have things ironed out on the defensive side of the ball. It's just what they do with the ball when they win it. Can they hurt other teams in transition? And I feel like they should because they have some pacey players who are good in 1v1 situations, like Newcastle's Miguel Almiron in particular. So I do have some questions of both Paraguay and Costa Rica. I just don't know if they're gonna have enough answers to overcome the likes of Brazil and Colombia. So yeah, that's it. That is all I got. Those are my picks to get out of the group stages of the Copa America. What are yours? After you hit like and subscribe, let me know your two top picks. And once the knockout rounds begin, we can react to our choices and then we can preview what's ahead. That should be a lot of fun. And two more things for you, actually. One, if you want more in-depth coverage of the U.S. Men's National Team, especially from me, then go find the Call It What You Want podcast that I do with Charlie Davies, Brian McBride, and Tony Miola. I'll put a link in the description because it's also on the YouTubes. And two, this whole upcoming month, I will be hosting all of Fox Sports' digital coverage for both the Euros and Copa America alongside Melissa Ortiz and former Leicester City captain and Jamaican international Wes Morgan. And we're doing pre and post game shows for every game of both tournaments. It's going to be a lot of fun. So come hang out with us on Fox Sports' YouTube, Twitter, TikTok, Insta, or FoxSports.com. Or if your grandparents want to watch, we're on Facebook too. I'd love to see all of your beautiful faces in the chat slash comments. So make it happen. Love you guys. Later.